For literally thousands of years, one simple prayer, beyond all others, has been on the lips of generation after generation of Jews. From King David to Steven Spielberg and Jesus to Barbara Streisand. It's the first creed that those born within the Jewish faith learn as infants, and for many it's the last they utter before death. It's the most important prayer of Judaism, known as the Shema, and taken from Deuteronomy 6, chapter 6, verses 4 to 9. It begins like this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Now, the thing is that if you read some English language Old Testament translations, you'll discover that the word Lord is printed in capital letters, L-O-R-D. It's all rather strange, but there's a good reason behind it. It's translating the Hebrew name Yahweh, the most frequently used name for God in the Old Testament, which appears over 6,800 times and is the Jewish people's distinctive personal name for their God. So why is this prayer and this name so important? Well, it's recorded in chapter 24, verse 2 of the book which is named after him, that Joshua reminds the ancient people of Israel that the worship of other gods had once been part of their history. He explains, long ago your ancestors lived on the other side of the river Euphrates and they worshipped other gods. In the ancient Near East, there were countless gods all vying for attention. Asherah, Baal, Anath, Dagon, to name just a few of them. The Hebrew surrounding nations and tribes had a pantheon of rival gods on offer. And if you read the Old Testament carefully, you'll soon discover that Israel was frequently tempted to return to worshipping some of these other gods. Which isn't surprising when you realise that in their understanding, which had filtered into their worldview from the traditions and cultures that surrounded them, everything depended on the favour of the gods. It was the gods who decided such life-sustaining issues as the weather, the success of the annual harvest, which in an agriculturally based society was literally a matter of life and death, protection from natural disasters, victory in war, good health, and so on. So it made sense that if other gods appeared to be doing a better job of protecting and prospering those who worshipped them than Yahweh was doing, then perhaps it might be time for Israel to make the smart move and to switch allegiances. But it wasn't just the Egyptians and the Babylonians, the Philistines and the Amorites who thought in this way. Later, the Greeks and then after them, the Romans also lived in a polytheistic, that's a multi-god world. There was a god or goddess for everything, every mood, every desire and every occasion. The Greeks had Zeus, the god of fate, Ares, the god of war. Aphrodite, the goddess of love, pleasure and beauty. Eros, the god of sexual desire. And Hades, the lord of death and the afterlife. The Romans changed their names. Jupiter for Zeus, Mars for Ares, Venus for Aphrodite, Cupid for Eros and Pluto for Hades. But they kept these gods' characters. Today, of course, we tend to assume that we've moved on from all that kind of thing. It was primitive peoples that served gods, whereas in our enlightened times, we've been set free from such immaturities. In truth, however, there are as many gods on display in our society, all vying for our adoration and worship, as in any culture that went before us. We're more direct now. We dispense with the personified mythological figures and instead we call our gods 
for what they actually are. Money, sex, power, status, the market, leisure, self-interest, health and beauty. But as sure as ever before, these are our gods. Why? Because, as has often been remarked, in the end, we never possess our desires. Instead, our desires possess us and we serve them. Human beings are decision-making beings. We all make choices. We all choose who or what we will serve, but we have an insatiable desire to worship someone or something. You can take away a man's gods, claimed the famous psychologist Carl Jung, but only if you give him others in return. The things that matter most to us, the powers and principalities that dominate our lives, that determine our sense of what's important, and the sources we look to for truth and meaning, for understanding, for right and wrong, these are our gods. They shape our lives. Or to put all this differently, you've got to serve somebody or something, although if you're not careful, it might only turn out to be a projection of your own values and prejudices. So, who is this Yahweh, the God of the Bible, that the Shema calls us to love with all our heart and soul and strength? How do we resist the temptation to remake Yahweh as a reflection of our own thinking and culture? What do you think are the biggest issues in our culture, both inside the church as well as beyond it, that fly in the face of the character of Yahweh? How do we create church communities where we can, as the Shema tells us, talk about all this openly? How do we discuss and debate it all honestly together without fear of rejection or exclusion?